Hi, and welcome back to another Tech Minds video. So you might remember that a couple of months ago, I released a video showing how I built the Mini Tuner version 2 from BATC, which is a dedicated digital amateur television receiver. Well, in this video, I'm going to show you the Winter Hill, which is a four channel DVBS and S2 receiver based on the BATC Advanced Receiver PCB. The main components are a Raspberry Pi 4, two FTS 433 NIMS, two PICs, and two optional LMB power supplies. Although in this build video, I will not be installing the LMB power supplies as I'll be using an external bias T. Now these boards are available to purchase on the BATC website. Although you do have to be a member of BATC, you can be located anywhere in the world to purchase it. By using a bill of materials list, which I found on the Winter Hill Wiki page, you can order the components yourself from sources such as DigiKey, Farnell and Mousa, or anywhere you can find the parts. The NIMS, the actual receivers, can be purchased from the BATC web shop, as these are actually quite hard to find. Now, technically, how this receiver works is that you feed the top two F-type ports with a signal from your LMB via a splitter. The Winter Hill software, which runs on the Pi 4, controls the frequency of the four receivers. Each receiver's TS stream is then broadcast on specific UDP ports. Then, using four VLC windows, either on the Pi itself or remotely, you can view each of the tuned video streams. Now, more about how you do this later on in the video. There are quite a lot of SMD components that you need to fit yourself. To fit these, I used a microscope, which has a nice 10 inch 1080p display. Now using small amounts of solder paste and then carefully lining up the components using some very fine tweezers, I used my soldering air station to melt the solder paste until the components pulled themselves into place on the PCB pads. I actually really enjoyed building this project. There were some components which didn't really go too well, but I'll talk more about that in a moment. But the package of these capacitors means that I couldn't really use the hot air soldering station. You kind of have to put them in place and then just use the fine tip of your soldering iron to melt the pads. And then just use the cotton wool bud to kind of wipe away that extra solder paste. There's quite a lot of pins that you need to solder in manually using your soldering iron. Now that's for the headers and also the NIMS, also the Pi 4 header. Now this took me pretty much all day to put together as I didn't want to make a mistake. So doing things carefully is key here. Now this is the finished project, minus the installation into a box and fit in the Pi 4 of course. Now personally, I think it turned out pretty well, but I guess I'll find out when I apply power. Now the two transistors towards the top left should be bolted against the case for heat sink cooling. On the bottom left of the board, there are three little voltage converters. Now these are the main power rails for the board. One is a 3v3, 5v1, and a 1v1 supply. The two pin connectors below each board should be left disconnected when powering on the board for the first time. This is so that you can check the voltages of each of the three test points using a multimeter. It's also worth using a bench power supply that has a current limiter on it, so that when you apply power for the first time, you can hopefully save it if there's a mistake somewhere on the board. Now this bench power supply is great for this very project. It provides voltage of 0 to 31 volts and a current up to 10 amps. Voltage and current protection can be adjusted using the rotary controls on the front panel. There's also a couple of fast charging USB ports, which is pretty cool and very useful. What I also like about this bench power supply is that it's very small, so it sits in the shack desk very nicely and doesn't actually take up that much room. Now, if you haven't got one of these, then I'll leave a link in the description below so you can check it out. Surprisingly, they're not that expensive. Right, back on with the build. You can see here that I've soldered in the NIMS, the receivers, and pretty much everything else apart from attaching the Pi. In the middle of the board, there's a placement for a 40 by 40 by 10 mil fan. Now, this is quite essential for keeping the Pi 4 cool as it's in operation especially if you're going to be connecting a mouse, keyboard and monitor to the Pi 4 for receiving and demodulating DATV signals directly on the Pi. I won't be doing that as I'll be doing it remotely, but I will still connect a fan. 
With the Pi attached, it's now time to prepare an SD card. Now I won't cover too much on this as it's quite easy to do. Essentially, you just need to install the legacy Pi operating system onto an SD card and then enter three command lines while SSH'd into the Pi to install the Winterhill software. Now, because I'll be using the Winterhill client software from Tom ZR6TG, I will install his build of the Winterhill software. Now, details on this are on Tom's website. Tom's version of the Winterhill software does still work with the normal Winterhill commander software if you want to use that instead, as well as the Winterhill client from Tom. So here we have the Winterhill 4 channel receiver connected up in my QO100 transceiver that you may have seen before on this channel. I've used a three-way splitter to take the signal from the LMB to feed both to A and B receivers on the Winterhill, and then the third goes off to my Pluto STR for when I'm using narrowband SSB portion of QO100. Now this is in a temporary place just for testing as I plan to utilize the Pi 4 in the Winter Hill for also controlling the rest of this transceiver. This means that I can remove the older Pi 3 that I'm currently using. You can't see it, but I did install a fan on the underside of the board to keep those temperatures down on the Pi 4. The Pi connects directly into an Ethernet hub and when powered on, it will have its own IP address. Now that IP address must then be entered into the Winter Hill client software. Once working, you can then use the spectrum view to click and select any of the available transmissions. There are four rows on the spectrum which indicate which receiver you are using, i.e. one to four. If a successful lock occurs, then the video will be presented in the corresponding window. To view full screen, you just double click on the window of your choice. Volume controls for each channel is also nicely implemented by Tom, so you can control the volume for each of the four receive stations independently. Now, if you don't want to use the Winterhill client by Tom ZR6TG and instead use the original VLC way of viewing each channel, then you can do so like this. This software is available to download from the BATC wiki page, and it's the commander software. However, to tune each of the receivers, it's far easier to use the Quick Tune application, which is a third party application. For this to work, you only need to add four receivers to the settings tab, each pointing to the same IP address of the Winter Hill. However, as each receiver's TS stream is on a different UDP port, you must have different ports for each receiver. For example, receiver one will have port 9941, port two will be 9942, and so on. Now with the new H266 encoding and decoding testing that is currently going on on the satellite at the moment, none of these viewing solutions are able to decode it. Now luckily as Winter Hill outputs the TS video streams on UDP, we can use other applications like MVP and FF Play to pick up these H266 streams and display on screen, while still using the Winter Hill as the receiver. H266 is very experimental at the moment and there is no official support in VLC. However, Tom ZR6TG is working his way to supporting H266 in a form of Winter Hill client. So keep an eye on his website or the BATC forum for more details on that. Now, if you've never thought about getting into digital amateur television or even just analog amateur television, then go ahead, give it a try. It's only really been six months for myself and I've learned so much from doing it and building all the equipment. I've also made lots of new friends via the satellite, which is a massive bonus because we all have one thing in common and that's the love of ham radio. Everyone is just so friendly and if you've got a problem or you've got an issue or you don't know how to do something, you can just ask and they will help you. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed this video and if you've got one of these, let me know down in the comments below or if you've got another way of receiving digital amateur television that works really well, then let me know down in the comments below. Until the next video, stay safe, thanks for watching and see you in the next one. Or maybe see you on QA100.